Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna iddata shuhuri inda Allahi thna ashara shahra. The number of months with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are 12 in number. This is how Allah ordained it to be on the day He created the heavens and the earth. Minha arba'atun hurum. From those 12 months, Allah says, four of them are sacred. We pause here for a moment and we'll return to the rest of the ayah in the end of the khutbah. What are these four sacred months? From the 12, is the seventh month of the Islamic calendar, Rajab. And then three consecutive months back to back. The month of Dhul Qa'dah, the 11th. The month of Dhul Hijjah, the 12th. And the month of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic Hijri calendar. This is our current month. And the 10th day of this month of Muharram, the sacred month, is known as Ashura. A day which we as Muslims hold in very high esteem, which will be in the coming Monday, inshallah. How come? And what is the story of Ashura? Imam al-Bukhari narrates on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said, Qadim al-Nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Madinata فَرَأَ الْيَهُودَ يَصُومُونَ عَشُورَا Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he arrived at the city of Medina, he saw that the Jews were fasting on the day of Ashura. <coughs> he said to them, ma hada? What is this? They said, هَذَا يَوْمٌ صَالِحٌ This is a righteous day. فَصَامَهُ شُكْرًا لِلَّهِ This is a day where Prophet Musa alayhi salam was saved by Allah from the Pharaoh and the Muslims. So Prophet Musa fasted this day in gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Nahnu awla bi Musa minkum, aw ana ahaqu bi Musa minkum, I am worthier of Musa than you. So he fasted the day of Ashura and he instructed the Muslims to fast it as well. Here the Prophet ﷺ was by no means imitating the religious practices of the Jews. And one of the evidences for this is that he made the intention that should he live until the year after it, he would fast Ashura and the day before it, Tasu'a, to create a mark of distinction. And it is also important to note that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was fasting the day of Ashura from as early as his time in Mecca, well before he even met the Jews. And it's important to note, as Aisha said, radiallahu anha, that even the Arabs of Quraysh prior to Islam were fasting the day of Ashura. But when he came to Medina, والسلام, the fasting of Ashura became an obligation. But then when Ramadan was mandated, Ashura became optional and Ramadan became the obligation. And when he was asked about the fadl, the virtue of fasting on the day of Ashura, and I believe every one of you is intending to do so, he alayhi salatu wasalam said, as Muslim narrates on the authority of Abu Qatada, he said, Yukafiru sanat al maadiyah fasting that one day of Ashura erases all of the sins of the previous year. And Muslim narrates on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَفْضَلُ الصِّيَامِ بَعْدَ رَمَضَانِ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ الْمُحَرَّمِ وَأَفْضَلُ الصَّلَاةِ بَعْدَ الْفَرِيضَةِ صَلَاةُ اللَّيْلِ The best fasting after Ramadan is fasting on the month of Muharram. And the best prayer after the five obligatory ones is praying the night prayer. And there are other narrations that suggest, as Ahmad narrates in his Musnad, that the day of Ashura was also the day where the Ark of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam settled on al judi at the Mount of Judi, after the flood had ended and the enemies of the Muslims were taken away. So Prophet Nuh alayhi salam fasted on the day of Ashura in thanks to Allah Jalla Jalalu. So it is a righteous and noble day. 
By the Qadr of Allah, however, there is also another happening that took place on the day of Ashura in this month of Muharram. And that was the brutal killing of Al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu anhuma in one of the most heart wrenching and heartbreaking and tragic incidents in history. The killing of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam happened on the day of Ashura. First of all, who are Al Hassan and Al Hussein in the eyes of the Sunni Muslims? People will ask. We say that they are the noble grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, whom he treated exactly like his own children and he said they are my sons. And he would say about Al Hassan and Al Hussein, Huma Raihanataya min ad dunya. They are both my two sweet smelling roses of life. And he would say about them both, Al Hassan wa Al Hussein, Sayyida Shababi Ahli Jannah. Al Hassan and Al Hussein are the two leaders of all of the youth in paradise. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be in salah and he would fall into prostration, Al Hassan and Al Hussein, as children usually do, would mount his back. And the Sahaba would come to move them, to dismount them. And he would indicate with his hand during his salah to say to them, leave them, let them play, leave them. Then when he would finish his salah, he would take them both and sit them on his lap. And he would say, Man ahabbani Whoever claims to love me must love these two boys. As for his killing, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, Wal Husayn radiyallahu anhu akramahu bi shahadati fi hadha al-yawm. Al Husayn was honored by Allah with martyrdom. On this day, Ibn Taymiyyah said, the day of Ashura of Muharram. Wa ahana bi thalika man qatalahu aw radiyah bi qatlihi aw a'ana ala qatlihi and Allah disgraced and humiliated those who killed him. And those who conspired and planned for his killing, and he humiliated those who were simply happy with his killing. This is our aqidah, our belief, with regards to these two noble companions of the Prophet والسلام, and family of our Messenger. Each year during this time, when we near the day of Ashura of Muharram, we will see the Muslim world divide usually into two groups. There will be a group of Muslims who will fast the day of Ashura in gratitude to Allah that Musa was saved from the Pharaoh. And there will be another group of Muslims who will use this day to commemorate the death of Al Hussein. And they will mourn and they will grieve. Some will wail. Some will put blade to body and draw blood and flog themselves and engage in all forms of self-harm. And this is what I would like to pause out for just a moment in gentle and sincere communication with our family, members of our ummah. How do we behave during times of bereavement? Our religion has not left us without guidance. In the basic matters of life, let alone the huge ones like tragedy and bereavement. It has given us a fine example and instructed the believer how he should react when he is struck with adversity and grief. It hasn't been left for you and I to decide how we bereave and how we mourn our deceased. And that is why Allah said in an unambiguously clear ayah in the Quran, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ we are going to test you with something of hunger and fear. And some loss in your money, some loss in your lives, some loss in your crops. But give good news to the patient ones. The patient ones are those whom when they are affected with adversity, they say, what do they do? How do they react? They say, we belong to Allah, to Him we shall return. So we ask those amongst us who behave during moments of bereavement, 
in a way that is different to this is your way better or the way of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was no stranger to bereavement. And tragedy was a common feature of his life. And he set the finest example of human perfection, how to cope and how to behave. How did he behave? When he lost his son Ibrahim, who was still a toddler, and he was suffocating, going through the pangs of death, and then he became still. What did our Prophet ﷺ do? He looked at him and said, Inna al-ayna tadma' The eye weeps. Wal yahzan. And my heart is grieved. Wala naqulu illa ma yurdi rabbuna. But I will only say the things that would please my Lord. Wa inna bifiratika ya Ibrahim la mahzunun. And I am very saddened by your departure, O Ibrahim. Look at the balance between the human impulse of sadness and grief and pain. And on the other side, patience, composure, contentment with the decree of Allah, and moving on, not dedicating the death of his son as a time for repeated mourning and wailing and self-harming. He didn't do that. And what is interesting is that this exact same narration with respect to how he dealt with the dying of his son, the same narration is found in the Shia references of Hadith, al kulaini's book, Al-Kafi, that some of the scholars of the Shia, they say, is the most authentic compilation of Hadith. According to them, this same narration is found. He said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And Bukhari narrates on the authority of Abu Musa, إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم برئ من الصالقة والحالقة والشاقة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم freed himself from the woman who screams when she is bereaved, or rips into her clothes, or shaves her hair in sadness. He is free from them. And Bukhari narrates on the authority of Ibn Mas'ud that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَطَمَ الْخُدُودِ وَشَقَّ الْجُيُوبِ وَدَعَى بِدَعْوَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ Whoever tears into their clothes during bereavement, or slaps their face, or cries with the crying of jahiliyyah before Islam, this person is not one of us. And what is interesting is that the same narrations are found in some of the Shia references as well, Al Kulaini's book Al Kafi, the same reference I quoted earlier, cites the following: لا ينبغي الصياح على الميت ولا أن تشق الثياب. They cite in their books, it is not appropriate to rip your clothes when you are sad, nor to scream and wail. And in a second narration in the same book, Al Sadiq is narrated to have said. مَنْ ضَرَبَ يَدَهُ عَلَى فَخِذِهِ عِنْدَ الْمُصِيبَةِ فَقَدْ حَبِطَ أَجْرُهُ Whoever strikes his thigh during a calamity, his good deeds are rendered null. These are not our references. These are the references of our brothers and sisters from the Shia community. So what then do you make of an individual who will put blade to body, who will flog himself or herself, who will draw blood, from male and female, and sometimes from young and old, in supposed mourning for the death of Al-Husayn radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Is this the essence of our religion? Is the essence of Islam this? Or is it a religion that does not intend for you to intentionally remember and relive the tragedy of the past, but wants you to move on with strength? This is Islam as far as we understand it. And that is why Allah, He is not in need of your suffering. He is not in need of your pain. مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ He's not placed any burden upon you in the religion, Allah said. And when the Prophet والسلام, saw an old man hobbling between two young men, the Prophet والسلام, said, what is this? Why is he not riding? They said, this is our father. He's vowed to Allah that he will walk and he will not ride. He said to him, Inna Allah does not need him to punish himself. Allah does not need you to punish yourself. Instruct your father to ride. This is how we behave during times of bereavement. If the Muslim was going to grieve, 
on every day where a righteous person from the past had died, it would mean that we would be grieving on every day of the year. Because on every day of every month, there has been a righteous person from the past who has died or was killed. So when will grieving stop? Or is it a matter of selective mourning, selective grieving? After all, who is the greatest to have died other than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yet none of our predecessors, whether Sunni or Shi'i, have taken the day of his death, assuming we know it, nobody has taken his death as a day for annual mourning. We know that Prophet Zakaria and Yahya السلام, were brutally killed, yet we have no instruction to take their days of killing for mourning. We know that Hamza radiallahu anhu from the family of the Prophet والسلام, was brutally killed by a spear. We have no instruction to take his death for mourning. In fact, we even know that Al Hassan, the brother of Al Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, was killed in a brutal fashion. We have no instruction to take his death for yearly mourning. Rather, the father of, of Al Hassan Al Hussein, Ali, radiallahu anhum jamian, whom the Sunnis are and the Shias are unanimously agreed is superior to Al Hussein. He was killed. We have no instruction to take the day of his killing for annual mourning or to visit the site of his killing on a yearly basis and to relive the pains and the tragedies of the past. So with that, we ask the question again, what is the day of Ashura? Is it a day of celebration as has become the situation in some parts of the Sunni world? Is it a day of grieving and wailing and aza? And we say it is neither this or that. It is a day of shukr, a day of gratitude to Allah for having saved Musa and Bani Israel from the Pharaoh. And when we say this, this is not to downplay the killing of Al-Hussein radiallahu anhu as we have established. This is not to downplay his killing. وَقَتْلُهُ مُصِيبَةٌ عَظِيمًا As Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, the killing of Al-Hussein was an enormous tragedy. We're not downplaying it. But we are simply being, as Allah intended, grateful to him during times of goodness. We are patient during times of adversity. How do we move on from this? The religion of Islam can be summarized in two principles. The first principle is that Allah is to be singled out in worship. Principle number two, that we single out Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in learning how to worship. And both of those principles are captured in the statement of faith. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah. None has the right to be worshipped by Allah, but Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. In the first statement, you identify the creator, the Lord who is worshipped. And the second statement identifies the way to that Lord who was worshipped. And that is behind the footsteps of our honorable Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every other door is shut and the religion of Islam is complete. <coughs> Conclusion, I promise to share with you the completion of the ayah that we started the khutbah with. There is a message for us as Muslims. The number of months with Allah are 12. On the day he created the heavens and the earth. Four of them are sacred. That's where we paused. Continuing. This is the correct religion. So don't wrong yourselves during these months. The wasiyah, the message of Allah. During the 12 months of the year, and specifically the four sacred months, this is one of them, Muharram. Allah said, don't commit an injustice. Don't commit a sin. During the season, good deeds are amplified, and sins are amplified as well. 
And so notice how the beginning of the Islamic year begins with a sacred month, Muharram. And it ends with a sacred month, Dhul Hijjah. And so if you exert yourself in Ibadah, in Muharram, and again in Dhul Hijjah, it is hoped that Allah Almighty will document you amongst those who have worshipped him all throughout the year. So make a promise to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu that things will be different in your life. Show Allah Almighty a bold and courageous change in your ways. Because if Ramadan was about charging your reserve of Iman, if the month and the season of Hajj was about building your fortress of Iman, then this month of Muharram is about the intilaqa. It's about the launch. It's about the release of the new, committed, refined, practicing version of yourself. This is the intention behind the month of Allah, Muharram. And whenever you are in doubt whether you are able to change, because some sins have been lingering for so long, remember the words of Prophet Musa, who said on the day of Ashura, he said to those who doubted, Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi Absolutely not. Allah is with me and he shall guide me. And every Muslim has an internal battle inside his dungeon, inside his deepest chamber. There is a battle. There is a struggle. There is a temptation. There is a doubt. And whenever you are unsure whether you can overcome it this month and be a different person once and for all, remember the words of Musa on this day of these days of Muharram. Uh, absolutely not. My Lord is with me and he shall guide me. We ask Allah to guide us.